Everyone has nightmares. But for actors, they can take a very different form because their worst nightmares happen when they are wide awake. <laughs> Hi, I'm Luann Moldovan, and welcome to The Actor's Nightmare. We have a great story today, but before we get into it, I want to thank our sponsors who have been so supportive of the show. First, a big shout out to Artists Repertory Theatre, Portland's premier regional theatre company, producing intimate, provocative shows that provide a home for a diverse community of artists where they can thrive and take risks. Check out their 2019-2020 season at www.artistsrep.org. Also, thanks so much to our patrons, Bob Conklin, and to Len and Susan Magazine and their company, Real Estats, providing statistical overviews for residential real estate in Oregon and Washington. Check them out at www.realestats.net. And of course, we are so grateful for the studio at North Rim, where we record our podcast. If you want to do a show, check them out at studio at North Rim. Dot com. All right, so today we have in the studio Kathleen Worley. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Sure. I have known you, Kathleen, for some time, and I remember with such fondness when you did uh, the Ursula Le Guin piece. Oh, yes. Um, oh, what? that you directed. Sea Road Chronicles. Actually, you know Rebecca you directed it. it. Re- yes, we Rebecca were both, Daniels directed both that. Both women in mm-hmm. Sea Road Chronicles, yes. And yeah, we did that at the bookstore, and I remember Ursula That's Le Guin right. was very pleased with that adaptation to the stage and agreed to be a board member for like a a month. Oh, that's great. <laughs> like, the, I'm saving this letter from her. The other thing I remember is that she listened to all the rehearsals with her eyes closed. That's right. She wanted to hear it and not be distracted by that's seeing right. it. That's right. She would come to the bookstore and sit down in her elegant fashion and just Close take it eyes. in. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and you've been a, prof- well, you were a, you're a tenured professor from Reed College in the theater department. I'm now an emeritus professor. You don't have tenure. Anymore. Gotcha. Once That's you've right. stopped, once you've teaching. stopped. Okay. You taught there for a couple <laughs> About of decades. Thirty years. Yeah. Acting and directing and solo performance and mm. theater history and playwriting mm. and pretty much all of it. A lot of stuff. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Well, where did you start doing theater? Where and where did you grow up? I grew up in Reno, Nevada, and huh. I started doing theater when I was three years old at the <laughs> Reno Little Theater. I was a gingerbread person in Hansel and Gretel, and I held somebody's hand and didn't say anything because I was in gingerbread. <laughs> <laughs> and and you knew from that three-year-old moment on that? Well, I thought it was pretty cool. Um, <laughs> and there also was a children's theater at the University of Nevada, and I did some stuff with the children's theater later. Huh. Um, and my parents took me to theater, and I just thought it was such a magic place where you could enter a world that wasn't your own. And I was actually really shy, and I thought, oh, if you have the lines that you're supposed to say, and this is what the character does, you can say or do whatever you're supposed to do, and you can't get in trouble for it. It's not your responsibility. The character does it, and so, You just step in there and you can be anybody or anywhere. And I thought that would be very cool. Nobody could blame you. Right. It was never your fault. (laughs) That's that's a good reason to go into acting. (laughs) When it often is your fault, but never mind. (laughs) (laughs) And so um, after your early days in in Reno, then where did you go? Where did you go to college? I went to college in Claremont, California. I Mm. went to Pomona. That's where Vanna went. I know. She Mm -hmm. graduated just before I came. Wow. Um, uh, and then I got my MFA from the University of California at Riverside. Okay. So, yeah. Were you thinking then, Kathleen, that you wanted to focus more on performing? Or were you? when did you start thinking about teaching, too? Uh, I really tried to avoid teaching. Mm-hmm. Um, my parents really wanted me to get a... a a, a teaching credential so that I could have some back real job as they some say some real job as they say and I thought you know that's a job that I might actually like so I better not have a credential because then I might fall back on it you know a friend once said if you have something to fall back on you'll fall back on it right I remember yeah that. so I did all sorts of horrible other things that I didn't like <laughs> but um street walking just uh, kidding no <laughs> um but I uh, I'm trying to remember. I mean, at UCR, the grad students mm-hmm. had to teach um, 
be teaching assistants, and I didn't particularly like that. But later, um, when I was working as an actor in Seattle, I, um, a friend and I did some um, classes at a sort of a studio that was there, uh, and there was also a group called the Phoenix Players of people over 50, and they mm. had some classes. And I had all these amazing women who had always wanted to dip into acting mm. and never done it for one reason or another. So I liked those two groups of people. Mm -hmm. um, and I taught at Cornish. I taught oh, wow. acting for dancers, oh. which was really cool because they could really, really move and they did not want to speak. <laughs> um, <laughs> I was like, okay, this is an interesting challenge. Um, so. And I came to Portland actually first in the late 70s to work at a, a theater company called Portland Conservatory Theater that Larry mm -hmm. Oliver, who was then the head of the theater department at Reed, was trying to establish as a sort of a professional um, analog or something. And um, that theater company was closed by the IRS because <laughs> he would take money out of our paychecks but kind of reinvest it in the theater rather than oh. um, so <laughs> I was looking for a job and he had not gotten tenure at Reed because he had sort of run up some debts for them as well mm. I think um, so they needed an acting teacher and so I taught one year at Reed just an acting class and then my then partner and I moved to Seattle and then many years later um, I came back down um, because I sort of needed money um, and <laughs> I had just done my one person Virginia Woolf show oh, all over yeah. the state of Washington wow. and I would go to auditions and I would get called back, but I would never get cast. And um, Burke Walker, who was at the empty space, called and said, you have to go away for like two years mm. so people don't think of you as Virginia Woolf because mm -hmm. we all are not going to cast you because we think everybody's going to think, oh, Martha, that's Virginia. Oh, God. Uh, <laughs> but my job is to be someone else. Yeah. Um, so when I was called... Uh, by Roger Porter, who taught in the English mm -hmm, department, mm -hmm. um, and he said they're looking for somebody to replace someone in the theater department for a year and a half. And I thought, well, I'll apply. That would be perfect. And I never left. Well, and you had your teaching certificate still? N no, I had my MFA. I've never so had you don't a teaching need to, certificate. Oh, because no, private, uh, it's yeah. not public school. Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. No. So that okay, that's your teaching, which is incredibly impressive. Really, <laughs> taught that long oh, and no. taught well. Yeah. Um, and today you're going to tell us a couple of stories, and it's from the time when you were performing, which you did a lot of. You were acting, I'm not just Virginia Woolf, which is stunning, a one-woman show that you put together. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, but you were doing a lot of theater, so. Yeah, I did, I did a lot in Seattle. I was an acting fellow at ACT, the American oh, Conservatory okay. Theater in San Francisco. Wow. Um, in the days when Bill Ball was running that company. Wow. Um, so. So and that was, uh, that, were you there about a year or something? Or? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Performing there yeah. at ACT? Yes, yes, all the little teeny parts, yeah. Well, you're a wonderful actress, I do want to say. The few times <laughs> I've got you. to see, you know, when you've worked, it's it's been just delightful. And So you were doing um, Arthur Miller's The Crucible? Yeah. And where was that? This what? was at ACT in San oh, Francisco. Oh, it was, okay. And um, the people who were acting fellows played smaller roles mm -hmm. you know we were the girls who were screaming and yes. going crazy and oh, we were God. people in the courtroom and and actually often the scenery was formed by people bill really wanted to str uh, stress the idea of witnessing things mm -hmm. of there being witnesses mm -hmm. to things so often the the rooms would be shaped by people moving into the shape of a room and watching what was wow. going on in the room. How and cool. he he always tried to refer to us as witnesses, but one rehearsal he said, could the wall move a little further <laughs> left? I'm sorry, could the those witnesses? of you who are witnessing this important event move a little further <laughs> left? <laughs> but um, in how, a, oh, go ahead. I just want to say how exciting to be able to work with William Ball. It was, yeah. It's, he was eccentric, but wonderful. Yeah. Um, it was actually right after ACT, there mm. was a, a theater company in the Napa Valley called, rather, 
uneventfully Napa Valley Theater Company, <laughs> and uh, I was playing Stella in mm. a production of Streetcar Named Desire. Uh, it was in the rack room of an old um, monastery mm. that had made brandy or something, and oh, so wow. it was. It was really a pretty fascinating place to work, mm -hmm. um, and. And the valley was really supportive, and different wineries would give us our cast parties as when oh, we fun. opened different shows. So that was good. But then when it was time for the crush, um, to, went to pick and crush the grapes, which was the last week of our last show, nobody came because oh. everybody was out picking and crushing yes, the grapes. Yes. That's what they have to do. Mm. But um, in the production of Streetcar, there's, of course, the famous scene where Stella runs upstairs and Stanley goes out and Stella, and she finally comes down to him and he carries her into their house and throws her on the bed. And Stanley was played by a pretty big guy and he would throw me on the bed and then just launch himself on top of me. <laughs> and so I would sort of oh my brace God. myself for the onslaught and, and, you know, he launched himself on top of me and then the lights came down. Mm -hmm. And one night he threw me on the bed he launched himself on top of me and nothing happened there we were and he was absolutely still having launched himself on top of me and he whispered now what do I do and I said fuck me stupid very quietly um, and luckily the lights then came down <laughs> but it was like don't you know what the next step is supposed to be but that was did he start to laugh uh, no, I think no, he was terrified. terrified. Yeah. <laughs> if if you could see, I just want to say to our listeners, Kathleen is a beautiful, rather patrician, elegant woman. <laughs> to hear you say those words, it's sort of shocking, actually. No, I, but I you, you were in your youth at the time. I was younger. It's your true. body youth. Uh, my body youth. Yes. Wow. Well, it's lucky. Okay, those lights did come down finally. That's true. Yes. Yes. But if they hadn't, <laughs> yes, I think I would have. I, I actually did sort of try to get my arms out so that I could look right. like I was wrapping my yes, arms yes. around him because they hadn't been mashed. And, and, <laughs> but luckily, the lights, I, I don't know what the person in the booth was doing, but luckily. They were so, they, they were so caught up they in were the moment, so caught right? Up in the oh, moment. wait, I have a cue. Yeah. What wait, do I do? Wait, me, me, yes. <laughs> That's right. Actually, I have another favorite story. Yeah. When Stella finally goes into labor at the end of mm, one of the mm -hmm. scenes, um, there was this charming older couple in the front row and I kind of grabbed a chair and leaned over and Stanley has the line something like what is it Stella and this woman in the front row yells it's the baby it's the baby <laughs> <laughs> oh like, okay love those matinee I audiences love, right yes yes <laughs> thank you so much and you just had to sort of didn't hear that yeah. Stanley yeah, well, didn't hear that I, I don't think Stella replies and no, Stanley just realizes is yes. it so he just realized yes <laughs> <laughs> oh participatory audiences it can They're, be wonderful yeah. yes <laughs> thank you so much for coming in today kathleen it has been such a pleasure it was really fun thank you for inviting me thank you so much for tuning into the actor's nightmare if you have a story you'd like to share and want to be on the show it's really easy just record it into your phone and send it in an email to actorsnightmarepodcast at gmail.com. And remember to subscribe to the Actors Nightmare Podcast. You can go to our website at www.actorsnightmarepodcast.com, choose subscribe, and then choose the platform that you like to use to listen to podcasts. Please subscribe if you like what you hear. And again, I want to thank our sponsors, Artist Repertory Theatre, Portland's premier regional theater company, and to Bob Conklin, an ardent sponsor of all things theatrical here in Portland. And finally, to Real Estats, providing statistical overviews for residential real estate in Oregon and Washington. This is Luann Moldovan. Thanks so much for listening. We'll see you next time on The Actor's Nightmare. <laughs>